everyone. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. I have like a million questions because actually, as I was preparing for this, the, the facts about water and water security and what that means are huge. But first, a very simple question. How did you two meet? Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Gary. You want to... <laughs> It's well, that the, the relationships developed to the point where I'm wearing Gary's clothes right now <laughs> because sure. Sarah cold. lost my bag. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we've come a long way. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, Matt had, had co-founded H2O Africa, which was focused on water supply in Africa. And I co-founded Water Partners back in 1990. And uh, we had similar missions. And we, we got introduced uh, and met for the first time, actually, at the Clinton Global Initiative back in 2008. And that's where we saw how much our missions were aligned. Uh, we had some really great models for getting water and sanitation to people in developing countries. And H2O Africa was getting really great attention to the issue and driving more funding to it. And so it seemed like the natural thing to do was to merge the two organizations. I also but was looking for, for a, I, I realized as I got deeper into the issue, the kind of the, the, the beautiful complexity of it and that I really needed to partner with a, a leading expert in the field. And when that person wouldn't take my call, I ended up with Gary. So. <laughs> but Matt, you could have chosen from like a million philanthropic issues. Why water? Uh, just the scope of it. I mean, it just, it underlines everything. All these issues of extreme poverty are affected by it. It's just, um, it just really touches everything. You can't solve any of these problems we're talking about today, you know, gender equality, climate change, all of these things like water touches all of them and, uh, and, and, and extreme poverty. So it, 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 you know, from the needless death of you know a million f kids under the age of five just die for absolutely you know a completely preventable death um, because they lack access to safe water. So there's that, and then there's the whole you know the opportunity cost, like the the, the lives that girls, uh, women and girls in particular, but but young girls are out of school because they're scavenging for water. Um, and, and when you meet these kids and you get to, you get to hear about their hopes and their dreams and the lives they're going to live and you realize that's only happening because they have this access to safe water and they wouldn't be in school, uh, it, it, you know, were it not for that access. Yeah. Well, I mean, the huge problem, and, and as you mentioned, the, the time, uh, 200 million hours will be spent by women and girls just today walking to collect water. 266 million hours will be spent by them walking to find a safe place to defecate. And so you have these, these massive problems, the environment, the global warming, they're all inter interlaced. But th the key and what we really want to bring forward is that there are solutions that work. And we've been pioneering those types of solutions, especially with access to affordable finance, so people can get the water and sanitation solutions at the household level to best meet their needs. How much progress have we made so far? Well, it's been, I mean, when we started, it, you know, it started with this insight that Gary had. Um, he'll be too humble to say it, so I'll say it for him. But um, essentially, he spent so much time in these communities, so many decades in these communities, and he was realizing that the poorest of the poor were actually paying for their water. They, they were getting water by dint of the fact that they were still alive, right? So it was, how was that happening? And he realized they were paying 15 times more for their water than the middle class because they weren't connected to the infrastructure. Uh, they just had no savings. So on a day-to-day -day basis, they were giving away their money in desperation to get this water for themselves and for their children. And, and so he basically repurposed the ideas that Muhammad Yunus pioneered with microfinance and said, well, what if we applied that to the water sector? And that, and that was a big thought leap for people at the time because Muhammad Yunus, you know, it was like it was about income generation, right? And these loans were about income enhancement, right? You, you weren't, you weren't, a lot of these people are working jobs and, they, and they're trying to, uh, they're leaving these jobs in order to queue up for water. They're leaving these jobs in order to go scavenge for water and it's incredibly unproductive. And if you could actually front them the money to connect to the infrastructure that was running right underneath the slum they were living in, um, you know, a, a loan for about $200 or less, you know, that they didn't have in savings, they could pay that loan back and actually end up with more income at the end of the day because they would, they would have more time to work, they would pay the loan off, and then they could pay a, you turn them into a customer, right? They were paying the water tariff, but that's a minimal cost compared to what they were paying every day. Uh, yeah, I mean, we were just in Indonesia and I was in the Philippines recently meeting people who actually bring these stories to life for us, right? This woman I met in Manila, outside of the slums of Manila, 
Lenariza was her name. She was paying $60 a month to one of these water vendors to come around and deliver water to her home. So she took out a loan from one of our partners, and she then had a water connection, as Matt mentioned, just right in her home. If you combine her loan payments plus the water tariff that she's paying a month now, it's about $10. So you can see there's this huge amount of inefficiency in the system. The market's broken, and that's really what we're trying to do, correct this market failure so that people can get access to this finance. And these loans repay at a 99% rate, and more than half of the people who benefit them live on less than $2 a day. So this really is a way to try to make the system more efficient to get rid of what we call these coping costs. Uh, I was on the Global Agenda Council for Water and Sanitation recently here with, with WEF, and we did the numbers on it, right? It's about $300 billion in coping costs each year because of the failure of the water and sanitation systems worldwide. And so much of that is concentrated among the poor. So if you can just redirect some of that capital through these micro loans, you discover that the poor really aren't a, a problem to be solved. They're really a market to be served. I think that's the message we want to bring here to, to these audiences, because it is a solution that can be fixed by capital and access to it. The, really, the exciting part for us has been watching how successful this has been, because this is an idea that, that Gary had, and, and we couldn't see why it wouldn't work. And it's worked better than we ever could have hoped. I and mean, we reached our first million people in 2012, and we're reaching over a million a quarter now. So we've already passed 16 million people that we've reached with this solution. And when we were in India probably five years ago or so, mm -hmm. our partners um, there, we were asking them, well, what's the big bottleneck here? And they, and they identified access to affordable capital. They were like, the demand is there. We need more money that we can loan out. And, and so that's, that's really the message that, that we're carrying because it's a, it's, the, the model's been proven. I mean, they do pay back at 99%. It's an incredibly good deal. So who's picking up these microloans? Mainly women? Yes, in, in which countries? 90% women. Mm -hmm. In which countries? Uh, gosh, we're in 13 countries now, yeah. so virtually in all of those. India and Indonesia are, are huge markets for this. Uh, Philippines is one of our fastest growing countries. Uh, Peru as well. Uh, Kenya, uh, Ethiopia. So yes, it's, it is scaling. And, and we crossed over $1.1 billion dollars in capital mobilized for these micro loans now. I mean, if you look at all of the philanthropy in the water and sanitation sector, it can't even come close to touching that in, in any given year. So it is, it's, we know that charity will never be enough. We know that it's needed because you need the charity and the philanthropic capital to correct the market failures, to help these partners launch these loan portfolios. You need that philanthropic capital, and that's what water.org provides, so that we can then unleash these market forces. But well, what happens is, so when you're, when you're going into a new market, so, so the standard is $25, get, buy, give somebody clean water, safe water for life. So when you start one of these things, you know, it's obviously expensive to roll out, so it's, you're, you're at about $36 per person, right? But as these loans recycle, the philanthropic cost per person reached goes down and down and down until, so in our more mature programs, it's well under $5 per person reached now. So it's a really effective way to... Yeah. So how many loans do you, do you want to do in the next five years? How much bigger can this get? Well, we've targeted uh, by 2023, we, sh we should reach, and we're well on target to reach 60 million people. Mm -hmm. um, do you get government help? Mm -hmm. Well, we work with governments, but not through governments. So we see a lot of the demand generation that comes, particularly for toilet loans. So we have to keep in mind about half of this is access to capital for, for toilets, simple toilets, latrines and poor flush toilets. And what happens is through government hygiene and health education programs, particularly like in India with the Swash Bharat program with Prime Minister Modi, all of a sudden, they as a government have created an incredible demand for toilets at the household level but people can't afford them, right? And so we work hand in hand with them in terms of getting access to capital for these households once the demand is generated. So we do work with governments in the Reserve Bank of India and others to really scale this up. How much do you travel? Do you actually go and see? Yeah, yeah, we places? go, uh, uh, Gary more than me, I, 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 I take time between my day job and I go, you know, I try to do one or two big trips a year <clears throat> because we're usually over in India or Indonesia or someplace that uh, uh, takes a little while to get to. So, mm -hmm. um, but and that's and that's really, really it's 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 a great way to reconnect personally with people, right? right? And 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 get that human 
um, connection because as the, in, in an odd way, the more successful we are, then the higher the numbers these you know, go, the, the, the less personal it becomes. So it's nice to go back and reconnect and meet these kids and meet you know, these women and, 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 and hear about um, you know, and interview them and hear about the, the, how their lives have changed. Well, and, and the trips are very much an incubator for us as well. So actually it was this trip to India a few years ago where we were in the back of the Jeep and we had heard from people that they need access to more capital, these, these financing partners that make the loans. And that's really where we created the idea of the concept of water equity. And you know, Matt's like, you know, there's got to be people in the U.S. If we can give them a, at least a modest financial return, they would make these loans if we could be the intermediary. And so Matt kicked in the first million dollars, and that was the launch of water equity. That fund, now water equity, has grown into really the first impact investment fund manager dedicated to solving this water and sanitation crisis. And we've launched uh, two funds now. Our second fund just closed at $48 million, and that's projected to provide uh, a, re a return on capital of about 3.5%. Uh, and our first fund has already paid out distributions that are north of that. So it's this way that uh, investors, accredited investors, can come in mm -hmm. and help us scale this while still getting a return and their capital return to them after the, the life of the fund. Well, and then we find really smart partners uh, like Bank of America and like, you know, <laughs> where we, we go to them and we say, hey, we have this idea, why won't this work? Or we, we, we can't understand why it wouldn't work. And they look at it and go, yeah, but we can make it work a lot better. Here's what you yeah. want to do. And they start to talk What's to us about distribution or blended finance and like how to build these products in a way, right, where you go, you bring in different people with different expectations and you put them in tranches and you and and and, they, and they've been just incredible at helping us. When we started out doing this, this is not where we thought we'd end up, right? So it's been really fascinating to see that. Uh, you know what role that can play and how it can it can it can catalyze yeah. serious change. Well, yeah, their their expertise, but also they put five million into the loan facility. Into to, interest to free, launch. yes. And yeah. OPIC came in at twenty million. Skoll Foundation, Hilton Foundation, IKEA Foundation, they've all come in uh, as investors to kind of help us launch this. So what do you need so, from these guys? So Money. <laughs> we need both. Both, yeah, yeah. both. That, but to your point, yeah, we oftentimes you don't know what you don't know until you get kind of the, the bigger financial brains in the room to help us with this. But we really are about uh, we're as much now kind of an access to finance organization as we are kind of a water NGO, and so we use that philanthropic capital again to bring in and leverage it up. Every philanthropic dollar that we put into this program with water credit leverages about $47 of additional capital. So it becomes a really good deal for philanthropists who want to, to leverage up. And then also that then leverages in this capital that comes in through, through water equity because now we have a pipeline. And right now water equity has a pipeline of $200 million in deals ready to go uh, in, in development. And we have a 50 million. We have 60 million under management now. So we really need to to launch our next fund probably later this year. Where it'll be a multiple of what we're doing now. So we need those accredited investors to, to join us. So what's the time lag once you close a fund? How how quickly can you actually start with the microfinancing? So well, we closed oh, yeah. we closed our second fund uh, in November uh, at in, at 48 million. And we already have 17 million of that out the door. So this is the beauty of it, right? We have water.org creating that bankable deal pipeline and then water equity raising the investment capital to quickly follow behind. And then the model just keeps proving itself. And, like, uh, and what's been great about these partners that we have is they get it, they look at it, and they get it. And like in 2010, we, we did an, uh, uh, a small gathering, and, and President Clinton came. And he, this was before we reached our first million people, but he just looked at it and he went, this is really going to work, guys. This is going to work. <laughs> He's like, you got to run these numbers up. Just run them up, you know? And, and he was right. He said, the more you run these numbers up, the more it's just an undeniable model and people, are, people will pile on because it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, wh when will you achieve universal access to safely managed water and sanitation? I mean, is this, is this a 30-year project? Is it a 10-year project? It's the mission statement of water.org yeah. is, is uh, in our lifetime, is what we said, for that, that, that everybody has access to, 
yeah. to safe water. Yeah. And, and, so and I have a few years on Matt, so it's gonna, we better go fast. <laughs> <laughs> and so on the numbers, how much do you need? I mean, do, do you have a, an idea of actually how much capital overall you need to achieve this? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's not just us. It's like, how do we leverage this model up? And what we're doing right now actually is, is creating a credit enhancement vehicle for commercial banks in India so that they can then have their loans de-risk so they'll go make millions of these loans themselves. And so it's gonna take hundreds of billions of dollars of capital. In fact, if you look at SDG6, the price tag for that is about a trillion dollars. So that gets back to like, we're not going to you know, use charity to get our way out of this, but we've got to bring the capital markets to bear in a way, and it's, it's crazy because it's, there is a financial return to be had here, but what we see is this is a bottom up and top down. The poor are actually willing to meet us halfway. They don't say give us free water, they say give us access to a loan so that we can do that. And when they can do that and we can provide the financial return, then we can scale the amount of capital to reach the magnitude of the problem. And that's really what we need to do. Are you ever discouraged? Do you think actually we should be quicker at doing this? And is there a, f a family or you know someone that access one of these loans that you think of to kind of think actually I'm doing it for, for this family or for, for it's, this it's, person? It's alternatively frustrating and really exhilarating because it's working so well, right? And so that part is really exciting and that's, and that's also a message that we want to get across because, uh, because people respond to ideas that work, right? Um, but yeah, it's impossible also to not see these kids and not think of your own kids and think about, you know, uh, you know the good fortune we had to be born in the West and, and, and you know, and, and to have the opportunities that we've had. And, um, and, you know, so much of it is about unlocking the potential of these kids so that they can, they can, they can be what they're meant to be, right? Um, because the, the alternative which we've also seen quite a bit of, is just this death spiral of poverty, this a life of absolute desperation with no hope at all. There's no, you know, there's no, there, there, there's no dream of a future. It's, 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 I know what I'm gonna do tomorrow and it's what I did today and it's scavenged for water. And that is, that is not a life. Yeah. It, it is depressing, but then it, it is hopeful too. I mean, and the reason I hope is, uh, there's this great book by Hans Rosling called Factfulness, right? And, and I recommend it highly. Uh, unfortunately, we lost Hans this, this past year. He did a famous so, TED Talk too, that probably yeah, a bunch of amazing. people have seen. And it's like, the world isn't as bad as we think it is, and it's actually getting better. So if you look at it, more than two, I and mean, you hear Bill Gates talk about this, you'll hear about it this week from Bill Gates, I'm sure. It's his favorite book. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, you know, more than uh, two billion people have lifted themselves out of extreme poverty in the past two decades. Think about that, that's huge, right? Again, a market to be served as opposed to a problem to be solved. And so many of these people want water and sanitation is one of the first things that they have. And that's one reason to believe. The other is that the coping costs that are tied up in this are equal to the cost of what it would take to solve the problem. So again, the coping costs can just be rearranged and so we can do this through nudging the market. And the third reason is there's never been, and you just have to look at the New York Times story just yesterday, there's never been a concentration of wealth greater in this world uh, and in this city than there is right now. And if we can't mobilize that type of capital that has basically zero utility for the incremental dollar to those who hold it, and put it towards something like this, especially when the poor are willing to meet us half the way to solve one of humanity's greatest crises, then we've all failed. And that's the message. Let's, let's unleash the market and this capital on this problem. Yeah, and safe water actually makes you more productive. I mean, this is what the borrowers say. And, and, and of course, it means that you have less you know, bills, medical bills, and basically less illness. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the cure for, look, the cure for diarrhea, I mean, I've, my, my, my kids have been got, gotten sick and I've had to keep them out of school for a day. The cure is clean water. You know, it's a death sentence for some kids. Um, We've been, when, uh, 10 years ago, we were in Ethiopia, and I remember just, we were watching these kids dig this hand, they were drinking, they were filling these liter bottles to take to school out, out of a hand dug well. And, and we took pictures, I mean, the water looked like chocolate milk. I mean, it was just so foul. But the alternative was that they had nothing to drink that day, 
right? And so, so you, you interview the elders in that village and you, they say, yeah, we've lost kids. Of course, yeah, we've, we, you know, if we, you get kids in these small villages dying every year because of something that's, that's in, that it, we solved here in the West 100 years ago, right? I mean, imagine, imagine if we cured cancer tomorrow and in 100 years people were still dying of it somewhere around the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's unthinkable. Um, just so everybody understands, you have two charities, Water.org and Water Equity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Water.org is the philanthropic arm, uh, philanthropic organization, again, that, that pioneers things like these credit enhancement vehicles and, and yep. water uh, credit. Uh, and then Water Equity is really an investment fund manager focused on providing a financial return while also providing literally uh, millions of people with, with safe water. Our, our current fund, uh, the fund two, that'll reach about 4.6 million people with water and sanitation over the life of that fund. And then investors get their capital back at the end of the fund and they, they get those distributions. And so that's, that's really key to, to the scale. The year ahead, what are your priorities? for 2019? We're going to run the numbers up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we're just, we're, we're growing fast and we're, and uh, it's just about getting the word out and spreading awareness. And, and I, I, it's, it's a hard thing not to want to participate in once you know how well it's going. Yeah, so. yeah. And I think it, it is scale, right? I mean, I would love for us to be a unicorn of, of social impact, right? You see it all the time in the, in the private sector, but we really have built an incredible team uh, that can continue to innovate, and we need the philanthropic capital to fuel that team to, to keep going and innovating and create the next water credit and the next credit enhancement vehicle and to, to really bring the resources to bear in a leveraged way. And so that's really what we'll be looking at is scaling uh, in the coming uh, years. From investors, what's the question they ask you the most? I, I mean, I think I think it's it's getting them comfortable with the idea, uh, you know, it's it's getting them past this idea that the poor will not pay the loan back. And I think right. that's the one thing about developing this to the extent that we have, that's been completely proven, right? And and you know, we've we've done so many of them, and they and and it's consistently coming back, being paid back at ninety nine percent. I mean, it's 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 such a it's so much of a safer bet. Than, than one would think just on the face of it, right? And so I think that's the first hurdle to clear. But when you sit down with people and they really and you and they look at the data, they they you know they, they they're pretty quick to come on board. Yeah, yeah. Over three million loans now have, yeah. have been made, and I think that that there there can be a certain degree of skepticism. But if you look at the conventional wisdom of water philanthropy, I mean, there's there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of water NGOs out there right now, and they're really providing a philanthropic solution, give us money, we'll drill a well, one more person will get water, give us more money, we'll go do another well. And so I think that, that you know, we are trying to, to think of it in a, in a very different way. And if you look at, even if we didn't have 99% payback, uh, coming about it from this perspective and the leverage is still far better than what's in second place. And that is 100% charity driven well drilling. Which will just never get you there. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Our thanks to Matt Damon and Gary White for joining us today. This concludes our program. Thank you for attending our second year ahead luncheon here in Davos. Thanks to Willis Towers Watson and PNG for supporting our event today. We're also excited, a little bit of Bloomberg news, that we're once again hosting our Bloomberg Equality Summit in New York in March, and we're expanding this important initiative to include Bloomberg Equality Summits in London in May and Mumbai in October. Now, we're also delighted that PNG will be founding our founding sponsor for all of the three summits, and we hope to see you all at one or perhaps all three events. Now, please join us for desserts and coffee next right. door in Salon. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.